Thank you both so much for joining us today. I, I wanted to start out with that early childhood federal grant that was voted down in the House earlier this week, the spending authority for it. Representative Horman, were you surprised? I was not surprised. Uh, there have long been different opinions about uh, preschool in the state of Idaho, and I think you saw that reflected on the House floor yesterday, different opinions of whether the state should pay for that, whether you know that should go more to families and private organizations, and a lot of that came out on the floor yesterday. Yeah, Senator, what's, what's your view on this? Well, I'd just like to say that this is something we've worked on for three years, and it was a really, it was a bipartisan um, group that came together, uh, S Senator Buckner Webb and myself, and uh, Chairman Clow, and also Representative Earhart. So I was a little surprised because I saw where some of those votes that I thought we had in the bag um, did not come through. And so the reality is it's, um, that money was to go for local collaboratives to see where the needs were to put some additional resources that would help families in the in those communities and it was totally up to the communities how it should be used and where the need was and so i'm i'm pretty disappointed it's a 6 million dollar federal grant and no state funding was going to go toward it and it was up to communities and families to decide if they had a need along with businesses and community leaders. So I was pretty disappointed. I hope we have a pass, path forward and maybe Wendy knows a little more about that than I do. You know, I, th I think there is a path forward. A lot of what came out on the House floor were concerns about the content, uh, what might be taught to these youngsters. And frankly, there was some solid evidence presented that led that to be in question. So you've seen us in JFAC take approach using intent language about restricting certain uses of funds or prohibiting certain uses of funds. So I wonder if maybe the path forward isn't around intent language restricting um, any partisan or political content that might be utilized. But, but as Representative Ward, or Senator Ward Engel King said, those decisions really do reside at the local level, but there were some uh, bona fide concerns that were brought forward on the House floor in sufficient uh, quantity to have the bill not pass. And it, if, if I might oh. add that um, Beth Oppenheimer uh, really has done an amazing job um, dealing with these grants and figuring out a pathway forward for us, and she's an incredible administrator and does really great things in the community with early childhood education. And I trust her explicitly, but if we need to put a little more intent language in, maybe maybe that's the pathway forward. Uh, Representative I, Horman, you mentioned compelling evidence that was brought up on the House floor. Is this something that you personally are concerned about coming up in these early childhood education programs? It is. Uh, some of the evidence that was presented was from the association's own website. And I did call Beth before the vote because I wanted that reassurance that this type of content would not be used, that the affiliation with the national organization that provide um, provides a lot of maybe more controversial content here in Idaho uh, that would be regarded that way here in Idaho. I wanted to understand their affiliation. And in the process of the conversation, she said, you know, we're separate nonprofits. They don't give us money. We don't give them money. And uh, we both agreed that maybe she should weigh the value of being a part of that network if that's the kind of um, content that's associated becomes associated with her association just because of the, the national association. So I do think there, I think there's a way forward, um, but it, it's going to involve some reassurances that that will not be part of uh, that association's mission. You know, and a lot of associations have a state association and then they have a national. And, and certainly our views are very different in, in Idaho than it probably than they probably are nationally. But I'm totally comfortable with the idea that the local communities will make the decisions and that families and businesses and community leaders will be involved in it. And I, I trust our local people to do the right thing for children. 
You know, so many of these concerns about content and social justice programs came up in the higher education debate in the Joint Budget Committee earlier this week as well, um, specifically in regards to Boise State University. Senator, I wanted to get your take on this. How much does the conversation change when we're talking about adult students, many of whom want these programs? Well, I actually ran the governor's recommendation uh, as one of the motions. We had actually three motions on the floor, but I uh, quickly realized that uh, when Senator uh, did a, an amended substitute motion that he was going to have the votes to get that through. And it was um, not exactly what I wanted, but sometimes we don't get exactly what we want. And what it did is it took $400,000 from BSU from the social justice program and gave it to Lewis Clark State College. And hopefully that will keep Lewis State College from ha Lewis Clark, excuse me, State College from having to raise tuition. And I see some benefit there. Um, the intent language is pretty strong, and I really do believe that most of our universities do offer some kind of uh, diversity uh, classes or social justice programs, and it's, it's part of uh, what they do on a university level is present all views, and as long as the, all sides are presented on an issue, I really don't have any problem with it. Um, that's where we should do it, you know, in an academic setting have all views presented and um, so i'm okay with the budget that we're sending forward but it wasn't exactly what i would have liked to have seen and i think uh, the issue is being um, called out pretty harshly when almost all universities including brigham young university offer diversity program and our our uh, businesses are are demanding it they want it they need it in their businesses Representative Horman, I, I wanted to get your take. How much of a concern is this for you and your constituents? I would say it's a big concern uh, in the House and, and from um, some constituents as well. Um, we've been having this conversation for a couple of years now, and some feel that uh, the universities have been more responsive. Some feel they've been less responsive. I have engaged in conversations with them and have been uh, reassured by some of the things that I've heard. However, this, this idea of bias uh, and making sure, as Senator Ward Engel King said, that both perspectives are provided. I have spoken with students who have um, talked about that not being the case, and so that's troubling to me. Uh, I, this was not a motion I could support. There were, there were a lot of things happening that morning and a lot of different approaches to intent language and reporting and restricting and I, I wasn't comfortable with the motion and so I voted no quite, I don't do that very often in JFAC. I try to support the work of the group but in this instance um, I could not and so we'll see where that goes when it gets to the House. And if, if I might add just one more point, um, you know, our, our university presidents are all pretty new. I think they've been in the job now for two years, some of them, and uh, I think they're trying to find a pathway forward that will meet the object objectives of our constituents and the people around the state. But, you know, you, it's hard to turn the ship that quickly and especially when we were dealing with COVID at the same time. So I, you know, I want to give them time to get things um, the way that they should be maybe or that the way that they would like to, it just takes a little more time. So I, I'm trying to give them the time they need to do what they believe is right for kids in, in Idaho and I, I know they'll get there. And we know we will get there. I wanted to ask you about your Sorry, I wanted to ask you about your concerns briefly, because we, we've also spoken to students around the state who say that, in their view, inclusivity is an Idaho value and that these are programs that they want to see. So is it, for, for some members of the House Republican Caucus, is it a matter of making sure all views are present, or is it concern that 
these views are there in the first place? Is there room, in other words, for this conversation to be on campus? You know, I think inclusivity is exactly what the House Republican Caucus is looking for, this inclusivity of all viewpoints. And we know that most college campuses are left-leaning. Uh, there are studies out there showing that, uh, you know, the professors. But I do believe, you know, I don't, I don't want to speak for all of my colleagues, but I do believe that inclusivity is the exact value that I personally am looking for and, and making sure that all viewpoints are, are allowed airtime. And I think kids are idealistic when they're young. And, uh, but I do think that these are the times when they um, can get the information from lots of different sources and then make their own decisions as they mature. And, and that's what we want. And I've never been afraid of too much information maybe too little, but never too much. Oh, Senator, what can we expect from the K-12 budget that you and Representative Horman are working on? Well, this one I'm hoping we're both going to be exactly in sync on. So, uh, and, we, and we're pretty close already. And I'm, I'm hoping that uh, that will be the case. And we're both looking at putting some extra money into the budget to deal with the learning lag we're gonna see in junior high and high school students. We know it's there and we're not gonna have very much time to catch them up. And so we wanna put some additional money there. We're still trying to see where we pull that money and uh, um, you know, and how exactly to direct it. We know there's gonna need to be maybe some in-person type tutoring and maybe some, um, some even summer school, but there's also going to have to be some extension on uh, licenses for so kids can take it home and and Wendy can talk a lot more on that she's been looking at that very carefully but the reality is we have record surplus right now and we have a lot of cares money or ESSER money as they're calling it coming in and it's federal relief dollars and we this is what it needs to be used for it needs to be used to supplement our school districts to make sure we make up for some of that learning lag that we're going to see. Representative Foreman, I, I want to get your take. What are your budget highlights? Well, I agree with Senator Ward Engel King there. Uh, what could be more personalized than learning loss? And a one size fits all solution simply won't cut it in this in this situation. It's, um, it's been unique to every child and every family. So we both agree that it's not just those in the K-3 space that need additional supports, but uh, those maybe who are closer to graduating and maybe suffering from loss of credits or those sorts of things, I think the need actually might be more urgent there because we have less time to catch them up. This has been a really complicated budget. There have been holdbacks. There have been uh, in massive infusions of federal cash. We're looking at a net $300 million gain, and the CARES 3 money isn't here yet. And so there is a lot of money to be spent in K-12. And I think if we use it wisely, we really can make up help our students make up the difference. Let's talk a little bit about that infusion of federal cash and the federal stimulus money that the U.S. Senate is debating as we speak. What are we expecting that money to go to, Representative? It looks like uh, we're going to have some nice flexibility with that money. Um, again, the amounts are just almost incomprehensible here in Idaho, but at, at least another $1.2 billion coming through the state and another 600 million flowing, some of it will flow through the state, but uh, it, directly for purposes uh, to local governments, cities, counties. And so one of our tasks, frankly, is going to be how to use it wisely. And, and those have been some concerns expressed on the House floor. This is not free money. And, and we need to make sure that we are honoring the taxpayer who's providing it to us and um, using it in ways that truly do help those who need it most. And I, 
I think we also have to remember that it's one time. It isn't going to be ongoing. So we have to be careful that we don't uh, deplete our general fund by uh, maybe massive tax cuts that because at some point this money will go away and our needs for education are going to be ongoing. I'm not satisfied with being 50th in the nation and per pupil expenditure, we can do better. And there's things that we need in this state. Um, we have huge problems with our facilities. And so um, there's just a lot of needs and we just need to make sure that we're channeling this money in positive ways that are gonna benefit students and it's gonna actually raise the needle and get them back up to speed because um, we not only have learning lags, we also have some mental health issues out there. Um, kids have been isolated and they've had, a, they've had a lot of things taken away from them and I know they're resilient, but if you've, you know, if you can't go to school or you can't see your friends, you can't participate in sports, you had your trip canceled and um, no 4-H, no FFA. I mean, a lot of things have gone away that's been very damaging to families and to children, and especially those older children that are used to being around their friends and peers and really need that. So we've got work to do. And Melissa, if I might uh, follow up on that, one of the bills I've been working is actually a codification or uh, making into law one of the programs that Governor Little ran during the, the, uh, the pandemic, and that was the Strong Family, Strong Students program that sent those extra resources out to students who had extra needs. 94% of that money went to public school students, only very small percentages went to uh, homeschoolers and private school students. But regardless of what seat that child is sitting in, it's so important that we do provide resources, especially to those most at risk. And so that's what uh, one of the bills I'm working on, the Strong Students Bill, House Bill 294, uh, proposes to do is continue that program and providing additional resources to low-income families. And one of the bills I'm working on Melissa and is really near and dear to my heart. I've been working on this for seven years, but it's to provide funding for full day kindergarten. And I think we have a pathway forward and we have an RS. It hasn't been, we don't have a bill number yet, but the reality is we have about 35 school districts that are offering a full day kindergarten right now. And they're using either a supplemental levy or their discretionary funds and 20 charter schools who received a grant from the Albertsons Foundation. So a lot of our school districts are doing this and they're seeing tremendous gains with their um, kindergarten students. And so I'm hoping with this uh, um, money, this relief money from the federal government, we can get that done for a couple of years. And then um, there should be um, some online sales tax money going back into the f uh, general fund that should uh, allow us to continue to fund that. But I think it's really important that our children get off to a really good start right now, especially since we know some of them probably la lost more than half of their time in kindergarten. So I'm worried about that, but I'm excited about this. We've got, um, you know, it's the first time I've seen a pathway forward on this and I'm very excited. I, I'm listening to both of you talk about your policy priorities and your budget priorities. I'm, I'm listening with my reporter hat on, but I can't ever take off my mom hat. And, and I have to say, this has been you know, for, for me and so many of my friends, the most stressful year of our lives, trying to juggle work and the you know, kids distance learning and everything like that. And I'm extremely fortunate in that I could stay at home with my kids, that we don't have any barriers with internet or language. We haven't had any job loss or, or housing insecurity. So when you're talking about these priorities who is at the table are you thinking about those families who haven't traditionally had a seat at the table who who are more likely to fall through the cracks in times of hardship like this representative yes well, and we know we've lost i'm sorry did i cut in i'm sorry but we know we've lost some of those students we don't know uh, 
um, exactly where they are right now. And we're hoping that now that in-person learning is coming back, that they will um, be back engaged in our school system. But that's very frightening for us. And parents have, um, it's been very difficult. And even with my own grandchildren, when you have four children at home and they're trying, you know, parents have to continue to work. It's been very difficult for them. So I, I know that there's a big need out there and we are listening. We're listening to everybody. We're listening to the community and teachers and administrators and school board uh, members. And we're also listening to business and, uh, you know, because it matters to them too. So, um, and I've certainly had a lot of phone calls from teachers and a lot of phone calls from parents and and they need help. So we're, we're doing what we, think we can do as quickly as we can do it. And it's never quite quick enough, but we're working on it. We definitely have an obligation to help those who may not have a voice here at the Capitol. And I, I shared a story this morning in House Education Committee about a, a single mom of, of three who benefited from the Strong Families Grant. She had to quit her job. And so then she was really in, in a crisis and the Strong Families Grant came through and was able to provide computers for her children, even a keyboard for them to uh, teach themselves music. And, and so these solutions really, really are unique, but sometimes it is incumbent on us who have been able to make it through the pandemic uh, without too much harm to help those who have suffered greatly. And that's what a bill like the one I'm working on is, is specifically designed to do, to reach those who have the greatest needs, whose children are at the greatest risk, and get resources into their hands to give them hope and to give them help to keep trying. And I'm hoping that, uh, you know, the programs that we put into place and uh, will be long-term beneficial to students. Um, we know that right now during the pandemic, there's some unique situations and some of the things can be short-term, but um, really hoping that we can put into place something that's gonna be lasting and important for children and for parents and, and for generations to come. And we really owe that to our children. And I've had some parents call and say, we're having trouble here, what do you do? Uh, we can't ground our kids, they're grounded already. And we can't take away the car, they can't go anywhere anyway. So it's been very difficult for parents to, to manage the whole uh, situation that they're in right now, not only with the younger children, but with the older children too. We know that parents are in the best position right now to know what their child's unique needs are. And so getting resources into their hands to help them meet what those unique needs are, I think is a great strategy moving forward. If there has been a silver lining to this pandemic, I think it's the level of engagement that we have seen from parents in terms of helping educate their children, supervise their online learning at home. And so they're very engaged right now. And I think that has been a great thing. We trust them to make the, the decisions that are best for their children. And I believe that educators have gone above and beyond. They have um, taken a really bad situation and tried to do make it absolutely wonderful for kids. And it's been difficult, but they have stepped up. And I, I think there's a, a more of a sense of value in what they do and, and more respect for the profession. And I'm pleased to see that because I know how hard they work. And, they have had, they've done a Herculean effort this year and without the money that they needed it to begin with, they just um, picked it up and ran with it as best they could. And, and I think we've put more resources lately into helping them, but it was very difficult at first. Some students didn't even have devices. They didn't have, they didn't have broadband and it's hard to, you know, they were dropping packets off at the house and some of them, they were delivering meals to their kids. So they've gone above and beyond. And, and I am so thankful for the um, teachers we have in this state. I know my son's teachers went above and beyond both last school year and this, and just eternally grateful to them. Representative Foreman, Senator Ward Engelking, thank you both so much for your time. Thank you. Thank thank you. It's always a pleasure to be here. And it's good to see you, even if it's not in person. <laughs> Hopefully yes. next time. Yes. Second that motion. <laughs>